I'm Sally Greenidge. In this program, I'll be looking at what's been happening in Key Stage 1 history over the past few years and asking how history in the national curriculum with this very young age group might develop in the future. But to begin with, we asked some five and six-year-olds what they'd learned about life in the olden days. If you were naughty, then you had to stay for a very long time at school and do extra homework. I watch um, a program in children's BBC on TV and it's called Aquila and they have all the helmets and all, all the suit, suit belts. My granddad fought in the Second World War and his and he still got the medals that he won. My mum watched Time Team and that's when um, they dig up old things. My dad got a sort of old sword which I've only seen once. And I can't remember what it actually looks like but it has got a case to it. I think it's a bit goldish and then the case is sort of goldy greyish. Lemon colour. Ooh, lemon. First impressions of history from a child's point of view. With me now is Dr. Grant Bage from Cambridge University School of Education. Grant, like most teachers, you've been keeping pace with the changes in history teaching, but you've also been developing books and films for use in the classroom. In the films, how do you make history accessible to young children? Well, Celeste, so I think we try and do what good teachers do in the classroom which is to make history a, an interesting and a meaningful activity for young children. And there's several different ways that we can do that. And uh, one of the main ones is, is, is through getting children handling artifacts and looking at objects. I mean, they can, they can see them, they can feel them, they can you know, touch them, they can smell them. And it, children don't, don't learn through words and through text. They need those sort of stimulating activities and lots and lots of resources to be able to really enter the world of history directly. So handling historical evidence like that from the start and and also through using stories. I mean, stories is a classic way of, of teaching children. And stories captivate children. It makes them curious. And stories also can communicate lots of information in ways that are sort of very clear and accessible and easy. And, and children love stories. So stories about the past as well. And how important is it, do you think, that learning is made fun? It's absolutely vital. I think history can be made interesting by artifacts and stories. But it also needs to be, to be stimulating. I mean, fun means stimulation, and so children need to be asked lots of interesting questions and to be prompted and stimulated by rich language. So lots of questions, lots of interesting words perhaps they haven't come across before, lots of rich language, and, and finally, really, I think, I think history needs to be playful mm. because young children actually take their, their play very seriously, and they learn a lot through play. They, they become absorbed by play, whether it's in the playground or in the classroom, and they enter a different world. And play stimulates children's imagination, and that's what we want to, to achieve through history. We want to stimulate their imagination and help them to enter the world of the past and, and perhaps to want to keep entering it and re-entering it for the rest of their career. Make them hungry for the future. Yeah, exactly, and, and hungry to learn more. Thank you. Well, let's have a look at an extract from the film Grant's worked on, where he's introducing the idea of museums to children and encouraging them to make their own collection of objects and artefacts. Let's make a museum! I borrowed some things from my grand's house. We had to talk about what it was like for people in the 1940s. Lots of toys were made of tin. And some of them had wind-up motors. We read the books. They had funny pictures. were black and white because colour was too expensive. Mm -hmm. 
We put all the kitchen things together. When we made the museum, we did some labels so you could see what was in it. I can see that's fun, but what are children learning from activities like that? Well, I think they're, they're learning a very big idea, which is how to think like an historian. I mean, real museums need designing, and they, the, the artifacts need collecting, um, the exhibits need laying out, the, uh, the labels need writing to communicate the, uh, the things that the, the people are seeing. And that's what the children are doing there. They're actually creating, playing at, um, creating a museum. And that helps them to get inside the mind of, of people who design and run museums and inside the mind of an historian. But surely these children are too young to really benefit. Well, I don't think you're ever too young to come across a, a, an interesting and a rich idea of, of thinking about the past. If children only encounter that at secondary school for perhaps two or three years, then I think it's too short a space of time. And, and we know that, that young children are really excited by activities like playing at making a museum, and that therefore they can be excited about thinking about history. And how structured do these activities need to be? Well, I mean, from a classroom management point of view, they need to be very carefully structured and managed because there's an awful lot going on. Um, you know, there's resources to collect and, and exhibits to lay out and groups of children to organize. And, and a skillful teacher, of course, makes that look very easy. Um, but in terms of, of curriculum planning as well, if you like, there's there's a lot going on there too because we're bringing in skills and learning objectives from the rest of the national curriculum. Those children are, are analysing and questioning and, and thinking as they're playing at designing their museum. And of course they're also reading and writing. I mean they're, they're trying to tell the story of the artefacts and the, and the objects uh, that they've collected and that sort of sense of telling a story about the past by questioning and, and analysing evidence well, you can see for yourself that, that five and six and seven-year-olds can really enjoy doing that. Now, you've mentioned using story as a way of introducing differences between past and present. Let's look at another extract which does just that. The storyteller is Smudge Smith, an engine driver from the 1940s. Smudge, they call me. Do you know why? I'm an engine driver from back here in the 1940s. That's why. Always got dirty hands from the coal and suit. It's so hot in me engine driver's cab. I'm always wiping the sweat off me forehead with me hand. I forget how dirty it is. And it makes a big smudge of dirt just here when I wipe it. Yeah. Look at your dirty face, smudge, they say. But I don't mind. I'm an engine driver. Steam trains. Whoa! They make a noise, they do. Not like your trains. Your trains run on electric or diesel. Nice and quiet. Mine here in the 1940s, they run by steam, they do. Do you know how they work? Well, you need two people, me and the driver, and my mate, he helps me, he's the fireman. My mate shovels coal into a big fire inside a metal box up there in the cab. The fire heats up a metal boiler full of water. And when the water's really hot and boiling, and there's lots of steam, I push these levers and let out the steam. Whoosh! It rushes round the pipes, pushes the pistons and shoves the wheels round on the track. Woo-hoo! And off we go. Let out the steam. Around go the wheels. Shoo. 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 Yeah, you love it, though. Children come up to the station just to see the trains. I stand on the footbridge, and when my train goes rushing through, they get covered in soot and smuts from the engine. They do. You ask anyone who's been on a steam train. Shoo. trains, no overhead power cables, no diesel engines rumbling and shumbling down the line. God, you've got to pull a little truck right behind the engine, full of coal, to keep you going. And you have to stop lots of times to fill up the boiler with water. In summer, when it's warm, I take the holiday makers to the seaside. Thousands of them! Not many people got cars, you know, here in the 1940s. Winter, I take 
take passengers round all the big towns. Do you know what? Last winter, 1947, we had so much snow, me and me engine got stuck in a snowdrift. They had to come and dig us out. And all the time I had to keep the fire going, the water boiling. But I wouldn't change it. Love my job. <laughs> I tell you what, talk to people who've been on steam trains, they'll tell you how great it is. Woo! Choo! 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 Tell them Ray Smith. Smudge. Thank you. Storytelling, another approach to history at Key Stage 1. But what are teachers made of having to teach history to five, six, and seven-year-olds? Well, we put that question to some of the team at a large city primary school. Been used for. How can we find out? They lived a long time. In the past, we very much started with what we felt the children's experiences were. We might have looked at nursery rhymes and sim simple stories. And I think we were quite happy that that was where they were and that was what they were capable of, uh, of taking in. Look at the bottom. Now we're much more aware of actually letting them handle um, objects. Much more first-hand experience, getting parents in to come and talk to them, especially grandparents. What did they do when they were young? So I think we're trying to give them much more an idea of the different sources that we use to find out. It sounds quite sort of high-blown for very young children, but I think they're able to understand that. But yes, we do learn from photographs. We do learn from people coming in to visit us, and also from objects that people have left behind. I guess it's gone on in many ways in the past under topics such as ourselves and our families and things, only perhaps people didn't classify it quite as history. They're fascinated in the past because it's so different. It, it, I don't know how real it is to them, but I think by actually handling things and comparing them with real things that they use today, it does give them a better insight into how people used to live. They're beginning to learn about concepts like chronology and, and whatever. Some of them are the very youngest will still not be perhaps be clear about what exactly yesterday means rather than just in the past. But from those sort of elementary concepts of chronology or um, gradually building up to people, for children later, actually being able to identify periods of history and not just as I think in, in, at one time, um, history was pre-national curriculum. We were talking more about things happening today and things happening in the past. And it was like there were two periods, today and in the past. Whereas now we're getting children much more clearly to see that the past is not all the same. How it looks from the staff room at Queen Edith Primary School. But is history important, given that the emphasis is so much on the basics of reading and writing? We asked a handful of parents what they thought. I think history is important because it gives children a sense of context. Um, it can help them see where we've arrived at where we are. It helps them also to realise that they're not the only people in the world, in a sense. It helps them to understand how we've progressed and it helps them to see that there perhaps is even more to, to move on to later on. So they're not living in a vacuum. When children are very little, they need to learn where they exist in a family to, to show their own importance. And as they get older, their placement in, in the wider world still is vitally important for them to understand where they come from. Part of literacy is to appreciate something and then try and communicate it. It's, it's a tremendous resource to, to, for children to appreciate uh, things that are in the past and then try and express it in all sorts of different ways. So I think there's one thing I would want to say that would be that it's a resource that should, should definitely be used and encouraged and not allowed to just drop back. Something of a positive message there. And in the next of Grant's extracts, David Bellamy gives us some clues about how history can be even more of a partnership between home and school. To prove what you can find in just a short time, I asked the Hadwin family to spend a couple of days tracking down their family history and looking at the things in and around their house here in Cumbria. I'm Rosemary Hadwin and I've lived here at Station House Ramside for seven years. It used to be the Station Master's house. This is my family, Christopher, my husband, Katie, who's seven, Rebecca, who's 11, and Bronwyn, the dog, who's four years old and came from Anglesey. The Hadwin started by getting together all the family photographs they could find and sorting them out into a timeline. 
Even if you can only go back a few years, using snaps to put together a family tree like this gets you remembering your past and having fun researching it. Now, photograph of Grandad Tommy. That's Dad's dad. And that is the actual steam engine, traction engine, that Grandad made. Nowadays, you wouldn't recognise the Hadwin's place as a station, but a few old photographs help to visualise what it used to look like. Even if the 545 from Barrow didn't wheeze and clank its way down your street, I bet you can find out about changes made to the places you live. Or, if it's new, what was on the land before it got built over. And don't forget the things you bunged into the shed or tucked away at the back of a cupboard. They might not be of any use these days, but fishing out old objects and chatting about them can paint a whole picture of what homes used to be like, even a short time ago. History, to my mind, isn't Vikings and Romans. It's five years ago, ten years ago. So that is history to a child who's only five years old. It's before their lifetime. So there's plenty around, even in your own home. And what about the souvenirs you've kept over the years? Things on your shelves that remind you of people and places. There's probably a memory attached to each. And remember, these tales from our past are chapters in our children's history books. But history at home isn't just about the houses we live in or the things we've got tucked away. Never underestimate what's to be found around you, wherever you live. Now, land use of open spaces like this and the buildings that surround them or you are always changing and they're well worth investigating. Why, even the everyday journeys we make, each one tells a story. So get out there and identify where there has been changes in the past, and even where there may be changes in the future. And don't just rely on clues found when you go walkabout. Sometimes you get a better view on a car or bus journey. Just how much have the streets you drive through every day changed since you've known them? For Katie and Rebecca Hadwin, the Monday morning bus journey to school floods them with clues. Everywhere has its own history to be discovered. Try it for yourself where you live. Grant, I can see how parents can help extend children's knowledge of the past, but isn't real history about great sweeps of time and famous people? Yes, I mean, that, that's a small part of real history, and, and that's the way that perhaps we were taught when we were at school. But for me, real history is also about some other very important things. And one of the, the, the most the richest scenes, if you like, for history to, uh, to mine is the seam of evidence. And there are so many different traces of the past all around us in the forms of evidence that, that young children can get very interested in. I mean, we've seen some of them already, artifacts and, and objects and museums and site visits and pictures and photographs and buildings and uh, you know, music and food and, and talking to their, their families and talking to friends. So there's, there's lots and lots of different ways that, that very young children can enjoy finding out about their past and other people's pasts. And history is really, for me, real history about getting children asking questions of that type of evidence, motivating children to, to want to find out. And that's as important as knowledge, though of course historical knowledge is important. But isn't there a danger that a child could come out of Key Stage 1 not knowing about an important period in history? Well, I suppose you could say that's a danger, but in a way it's inevitable because we can't teach children everything they need to know between the ages of, of 5 and 7. They will come out knowing about some famous people, and they, they will come out of Key Stage 1 history having looked at some people beyond living memory. But, of course, you could say they're not going to know anything about, um, you know, the Tudors or or um, Stone Age people or the Victorians. But what's really more important than that is that they'll have in encountered some of the tools, some of the ways of finding out about history, and, and perhaps grasped and, and mastered some of those. And for me, that's what, that's what real history can do. It gives children the, uh, the basis upon which the rest of their learning about history can, can be built on. 
And what would you say is the most palatable form of offering the information to children? Well, we've already talked about, um, about stories as a, as a way of in, enticing children into wanting to learn about the past. And in the sort of film stories that we use, we've, they've often used devices like, like puppets. And uh, that's, not, I mean, that's not just for fun. It's because it, it's based upon research into how children watch television. And research has shown that young children, especially between the ages of four and eight, that their attention is, uh, is galvanized when, uh, when music comes on and, and when puppets come on. And it's also shown that children like to see other children doing things on the screen that they enjoy doing themselves. So we've got, uh, we've got guessing and guessing games and all sorts of gaming activities going on in many of the films that we designed because that gets children wanting to emulate what they see on the screen and gets them thinking about history. How important is it to find the balance between fun and facts? Well, I mean, I think it's vital, and any, any teacher in the classroom will, will tell you that as well. But facts can be made uh, palatable and, 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 and exciting and enticing by making them fun. So it's a, it's a delicate mixture between lots and lots of information and content and facts and interesting, stimulating, fun ways to actually want to find out that information and to use it in some way. Well, let's have a look at another of your films, The Milk Jug Mystery. The Milk Jug Mystery. There's something missing inside this kitchen. Kettle for boiling and pan for frying. Where's the fridge? But there's something missing inside this kitchen. Some scales for weighing. Tin bowl for doing dishes. Wooden pegs for the washing. There's something missing inside this kitchen. Where's the fridge? But what's this we found in the kitchen? Is it a cleaning cloth? Is it a hat? Is it a hanky? It's a mystery. The, the milk jug mystery. Lots of things in that kitchen were different from what we use now. Abby? Yes, Brogsworth? Where's that music coming from? I don't know, Brogsworth. It's our music. It's 1940s music. Different from the music you listen to. We play it for our dancing, but not on a CD player. On a gramophone like this. Wind up the handle, put the record on the turntable, put the needle on the record, and out comes the music. Then we get ready to dance. We're wearing clothes like people used to wear in the 1940s when they went out dancing. Different from the things you wear now. Black bow tie, long black jacket, shiny shoes. Long dress, fur cape, gloves and a little handbag. We'll show you how we dance. dance steps like we've just done to find out what dancing was like in the 1940s I could dance like that Abby and I don't need a partner why not because I've already got four feet <laughs> <laughs> milk jug mystery produced by English Heritage Education Service joining us now is Christine Wilson the early years coordinator who we saw earlier in the program Chris you've been watching those extracts with us it seems much more ambitious than when we were at school is it working Yes, I think it's working very well. I think the national curriculum has given us an opportunity to focus on what history is really all about, especially for young children. And we feel that the starting point is with the child. Very much their own experiences coming into school through their family and through their immediate environment. Then we can move it on with year one and two, out into the wider world, and the school and their local environment. And I think the skills that the children develop by looking at history projects,
can develop the skills that they need in all curriculum areas, science and maths and language skills too. So the teaching at this stage, you're really preparing them for the further stages? I think we are. We're introducing them to artefacts, starting with stories that obviously interest them and excite them. And by bringing in objects as well from home or from the school projects that we have, um, it, it just gives them another way of looking at the world, that it isn't just here and now, that they have a history which is unique to them. And especially in a school with a lot of multicultural connections, you need every child to feel involved and that their own history is important. And how can parents back up teaching at school? In two ways, really. They can come into school and join in and bring their experiences in and enhance what's happening in the classroom. And also, the children can take work home, little homework projects, and bring back their experiences from home with their own parents, grandparents, however many generations they can cope with, uh, and bring those experiences into school. And that just makes it all so relevant to them. And Grant, what about the future? Well, I think what's vital is that we build on the successes of the recent past. As, as Chris has been describing, there's been a, a sort of quiet revolution in, in history in, in Key Stage 1 with five, six, and seven-year-olds. I mean, publishers and parents and people like English Heritage have, have supported the curriculum in, in many exciting ways, and there's many more resources now than there ever used to be. So we don't want to waste those. And, and teachers now feel so much more confident teaching history with, with very young children. And it's absolutely vital that we build on that confidence for the future. But in, in perhaps the more medium term, there's several areas that we can develop into. I mean, one obvious one is, is information and, and communication technology. And that's everything really from the, the use of, of video and, and film in the classroom through to the, the use of personal computers to, um, to access websites and to, for children to, to read CD-ROMs. So we'll, we'll need to perhaps make better use of information and communication technology. Um, and there's great emphasis on literacy. How can history help there? Well, uh, history is a very linguistic, a very linguistic subject. We, you, you can't really start to learn history without stumbling across different sorts of words and uh, lots and lots of, of questions and different reasons to to write in various ways. Whether it's uh, you know describing an artifact that's been brought in, or perhaps um, explaining uh, what's been going on, or or uh, listening to somebody talking about uh, life in the, in, the, in the old days. Uh, lots of reasons to use language that we've heard about. I mean, certainly in the national curriculum, they talk about purposes and audiences, and history is perfect for that, because you're reporting back and gathering information. And how you present it is the challenge, really. And I think in that way, it really does add a new dimension to the language, that uh, the language work they're doing generally. Well, I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there, but Grant Bade and Christine Wilson, thank you very much. And let's hope that all of us will be able to keep on developing the ways we introduce Key Stage 1 children to history and help them towards a better understanding of the past. Goodbye. Hello, I'm Sally Greenwood, and this program is about teaching history at Key Stage 2. With help from English Heritage's Education Service, I'll be looking at what's been happening over the past few years and asking how history will feature in the curriculum of the future. We asked some 7 to 11 year olds what they enjoyed about the history they're taught at school. Once Mrs. Woodhouse told us a story, and then we, um, she told us quite a few stories, and we had to make up our own one um, about the same sort of people but a different adventure. Um, but stories sometimes tell you about the gods and what the people do. I like reading, but I don't really like. Um, learning about history in books. I like it when the teacher explains or we go on visits and outings 
and um, basically when the teacher tells us a story, a real story, I just, I just like it then. I don't really like reading it in books. Really, it's rather boring sitting down in rows and just teaching history or learning history, but when you're out on trips, you actually see what ground they, uh, the uh, whatever you were learning about were trodden on by, and out on trips you learn more because people pay attention because it's fun. When we were doing the Greeks, then people brought in pots. Um, I don't think they, were, they weren't real ones, but they were pots and I think you should get more artefacts, not real artefacts, but fake artefacts in your class to study and look at. The Anglo-Saxons was one of my favourites because um, when we went on our school trips, um, we could go inside, um, I think it was the Thames Hall, wasn't it? With, um, and you saw pictures of a story, I've forgotten what that story was. But it was really good and it was like you were really Anglo-Saxon because I got to sit at, right at the table where the thing would have sat and there was a fire with the cauldron in the middle. History from a pupil's perspective. With me now is Mike Corbishley, Head of Education and Interpretation at English Heritage. Mike, you've been supporting teachers in the work they do and also publishing films and books to be used in the classroom. How has the national curriculum influenced history at Key Stage 2 in the 1990s? Well, I think it's been a good influence on, on history. Uh, we're seeing now um, tremendously interesting history being taught and children learning about new and exciting areas of the past. But I think it's been a big challenge for teachers. The history document sets out a whole range of periods that have to be studied and the methods by which uh, we study history now. So there are lots of new things for teachers to, to cope with. For children, I think it's been a big, big revolution. I mean, for the first time, they've had to study history from a range of sources. So they, they're looking at objects, they're looking at documents, they're visiting sites, and they're asking their parents and grandparents about the past. So they're interacting with history uh, in a much more positive way than, than ever before. And what part does television have to play in all this? Well, television is, is another format that uh, we can present uh, the, the past in. It's part of history curriculum work, part of the sources they, they have to use. So why not use a format which is familiar both to children um, and to their parents? It's a, it's a major part of, of our society today. Okay, well, let's have a look at an extract from a film Mike has produced. It's about the Saxons, and it puts the historical information into a television format pupils should recognize. Yes, outside it may be raining, but here in the museum, we're on the history trail. So will you welcome, please, our guide and interpreter, the sensational Mr. John Shuttleworth. Yes, I'm John Sutherland, and welcome to the best show you've ever seen about the Anglo-Saxons. The history, the mystery, and all the bits in between. So, stay with us, will you, for Talking Saxon! <laughs> what sort of houses did these Saxons live in? Dark and drafty, cool or cosy? One story, two story? Well, out there on location, with the whole story, is Talking Saxon's roving reporter, Mark my way. Oh. Thanks, John. Now, I'm here in Westow Anglo-Saxon Village in Suffolk, where they're constructing wooden houses like the ones the Saxons would have made over 1,500 years ago. And with me is the man in charge, Alan Baxter. Alan, why are there houses here? Because this really was a place where the Anglo-Saxons once lived. We know this because the whole place was excavated. Now, the wood that was used here once, most of that's rotted away. But we did find pits and post holes. 
and they gave us important clues telling us how these buildings may once have looked. Let's find out how the buildings are constructed. What are you doing? I'm making a triangular shaped plank and when I've finished working it I should be able to put it up on the end of the building now. So how do we know that they used wood instead of bricks for instance? When we excavated the site uh, 25 years ago, we found the remains of burnt planks that the Saxons had left in the earth. Now, I've looked around and noticed there are many different types of buildings. What is this? Well, the archaeologists found that in some of the houses, they seem to have loads of, for example, looms in there, which makes us think that some of the houses were used for working in, for example, weaving in, and yet others were different, others just for living in. And they were all grouped around a central hall, which may have been for meetings or feasts. So, John, it seems there are different buildings for different activities. There are all groups around the hall, a place for feasts and fun. Mike, surely that's entertainment, not history. Well, both surely. I mean, history teaching in the past used to be tremendously boring. I, how I ever became interested in history, I don't know. Textbooks, you know, the odd picture of a, of a Tudor house, and you were expected to be interested in it. Well, I think, I think now we've got to... We're looking at a different society. We've, we've got to present things in a, in a more interesting way. So I'd say, well, it is entertaining. Um, it's supposed to be entertaining. History um, is about quite difficult concepts. And I think you need to introduce children into those difficult concepts in a whole variety of ways. And sometimes that might be presenting them with an object from the past which they can look at and investigate, something they, they've never seen before. That's for the Saxon pottery. Um, but another way, um, surely, is to, is to grab their attention and get them thinking. To bring the past to life. Yeah. And the, the past that we're asking them to, to look at is sometimes very, very complex. They're expected within the National Curriculum of History um, to be making historical inquiries. We're expecting them to look at interpretations of evidence. So in the film, there, there are interpretations there, presenters uh, encouraging you to think about Saxons uh, in a different way. Uh, from, the, from the concepts, we still need to come back to the evidence. What is the evidence for, for the past? Uh, in the past, in history teaching, we weren't given evidence. We were told, this is what happened. Now we're saying to children, well, there's a whole range of things that we can give you, say, from the Saxons. There's a bit of this, a bit of that. Some people say this, some people say you that. You draw the conclusion yourself. Yeah, you have to, you have to make, up, make up your own mind, in a sense. But it's got to be based on evidence. Right, well, here's evidence about Saxon food and religion and another extract from Talking Saxon. Are you feeling peckish? I hope you are. Because I'm talking Saxon, live in the gallery, in his cookery corner, baking, simmering and frying. Well, it is a bit hot under these lights. No, seriously. To tell us all about Anglo-Saxon food and how to cook a Saxon dish, will you give a very hearty welcome to celebrity chef, Mr Roland Butter. Talking Saxon. Thank you very much. Let's give a drop. Uh, let me tell you what I've got here. This is a chicken stew, a very typical Anglo-Saxon dish. Earlier on, I put some water in this pan. I added some chicken pieces yes. and some leeks. What's these funny there? things? Yeah. And those, that's pot barley. Is it? Pot barley, very common in Saxon times. Looks yeah. like maggots. It does a bit. Of... Anyway, I'm letting this simmer for a little... That's nice. What's that? That's fine washing up, Bob. Is it? Yeah. Oh, still very nice, though. While this is simmering, let me tell you about some of the other things that Saxons used to eat. Please do. First of all, bread. One of the most important ingredients in any Saxon meal. Have a look at that. It's a bit hard, though, isn't it? It is. That's because most people couldn't afford yeast to make the bread rise. See? But most bread, or all bread, of course, is made with flour, and <laughs> flour was made in those times with a quern. And this is a quern. It's um, two pieces of stone, and you put your grains of rye, or wheat, or whatever in the middle there, and you turn it round. I've got a handy antler to show you how to do it. And the flour comes out round the sides. Mm. It'd be much simpler to go to the supermarket for a bag of flour, wouldn't it? If you were a farmer, and most people were, then meat, you would have had meat. Although you probably wouldn't have eaten it every day. 
Uh, here I've got some chicken, some pig, some ox, some sheep or lamb. If you lived by the sea or near a river, you would have had plenty of fish. Sprats, mackerel, oysters, mussels, that sort of thing. I see. Well, we could have had fish and chips instead of maggots. <laughs> you couldn't have had the chips because, of course, the potato didn't arrive in this country for five, six hundred years after Saxon times. Oh, imagine that. A world without chips. <laughs> but you could have had lots of fresh vegetables, particularly in the summertime. Or in the wintertime, you would have had dried beans or dried peas. Now, a little bit of salt I'm going to put in here. Very important part of Saxon cooking, both as a flavouring and a preservative. I see. And the dish is ready for tasting. There you are, sir. Thank you very much. I'm starving. <laughs> mm, that's quite nice. Not as nice as my wife shepherd's pie, though. Have a drink to go with it. I'd love to, but I've got to move on. Celebrity chef, Roland Butter. And now it's time for a little information interlude. The first Shuttleworth Saxon summer. Many Anglo-Saxons believed that when they died, they went on to a new life and that they could take things into the new life. So people were buried with their belongings. A chieftain with his weapons, including a shield with a raised boss finger guard in the center precious glass drinking cups with the body of someone wealthy. Unlike Christians, Anglo-Saxons worshipped different gods whose names we still use for days of the week. But gradually, over many years, Saxons converted to Christianity and gave up their burial traditions. Right, and there'll be another Shuffleworth Saxon sum up later in the show. But now, it's back to mark my words, out there at Westow Anglo-Saxon village with some animals. John, we know the Anglo-Saxons were good farmers, and here at Westow, they think they've managed to work out which animals the Anglo-Saxons would have farmed. So let's get stuck in the mud and find out. Lance Webb, you're an education officer here. Chickens, pigs, where do we start? The Anglo-Saxons here at Westow had sheep and horses and cattle and definitely pigs. Pigs at Westow are stocky and hairy because their life would have been in the woodlands around the village. What would they have been used for? Well, mainly as a source of meat, but also the Anglo-Saxons knew about resources, so they'd use the skin of the animal as leather. And how do we know that the pigs here are the same ones that the Anglo-Saxons farmed? Well, that's a good question. When the site was excavated, thousands and thousands of bones were found here, and those bones can help us understand what the animals were and what size they were as well. Thanks, Lance. Back to you, John, in Ipswich. <laughs> Saxon daily life and belief. Mike, don't these films tend to show that history is more about evidence and artifacts than dates and places? Well, I think history is about all of those, all of those things. It's a question of how you, how you get to that point. If you want to start with dates and places, as we used to in, the, in past teaching history, or do you start with the evidence and lead up to it? You could argue that dates and places are simple things you can look up. And usefully, in an educational sense, you can ask children to go and investigate for themselves. I mean, in, again, in the past, um, where, do we, where do we get to by making children learn dates and learn names? Did they understand history anymore? I doubt it very much. Go into primary schools today, and you will often see really interesting timelines, perhaps stretched a washing line ac across the classroom, showing that, that children are um, getting to understand where things are in the past. But it, as I said before, it's not, it's not quite as simple as that. There are arguments about where things were, when things happened, and what happened afterwards. So it's a matter of integrating dates and places with evidence and artifacts? Yes, they're both important. Well, let's have a look at another clip which does refer to real people and real places, this time from Talking Roman. Now, never mind the Romans, what was a Celt like? Well, yeah, let's bring one on now. She's a woman, she's a warrior, she's a warrior queen. Ooh. Will you please give a very warm welcome to a lovely lady, bags of personality, queen of the Icani. 
It's arcane, actually. Queen Baudicea! <laughs> Lovely. It's Boudicca, actually. Yeah. Are you sure? I thought it was Boudicca. Well, people get confused because they see it written down. They don't know how to pronounce it. Oh, I see. Anyway, it's lovely to have you on the show. Uh, what have you been up to? Because you're like the Celts. Weren't particularly fond of the Romans, were you? Well, the Romans decided they wanted to civilise us, and we didn't need to be civilised. Oh, I see. We were very good farmers. We had fine wooden houses. Yeah, no central eating, though. But we <laughs> shared one fire. Now, we couldn't write or read, but then we had practical skills. The Romans brought over all these elaborate temples and buildings. We were happy praying in the open. Yes, but you did turn a bit nasty towards the Romans, didn't you? After my husband died, the Romans became very nasty indeed. Oh. They wanted all my family's wealth. They wanted to take our land. Do you know they even tried to take back the money they'd given us to develop our farm? Really? Oh. They oh. treated us like slaves. Oh. I simply did what any mother would have done for her daughters. Let them join the brownies. <laughs> I got Celtic warriors into the army and got them to fight those Romans. Oof, you're taking a bit of a chance there, weren't you? The people had had enough of the Romans' taxes and their temples. They wanted to drive the tyrants out of the country. Oof. The Romans were very cruel, ruthless people. Oh. They were only interested in money. They constantly took things that weren't theirs. Did they? And they expected the people to pay taxes. Oh. And what about their wall and the Balkan Gate? If these Romans are that strong, why did they need a big wall to hide behind? That's true, yes. Yeah. Good point. We had to stop your violence. We wanted peace. Obviously, we had to defend ourselves and show our strength. Otherwise, your savages would have returned Britain to the sort of chaos we found when we came here. Ah. Hey. Well, it's hot enough, isn't it? Would you rather have been a Celt or a Roman? We'll find out later. Hey, shut up. Let's have another question. The comedian John Shuttleworth, played by Graham Fellows, hosting Talking Romans. Now, one important feature of history teaching is a site visit. In English heritage film Roll Up, a group of teachers use classroom drama techniques to set the scene for their excursion to a medieval castle. For Linda and her team, the real opportunity of their visit was to explore the life of the castle at a particular moment in history, as well as to understand the building's function and its layout. We were looking more we really at the period than the castle, role, weren't we, really? Mm. I mean, we could have looked at the castle, but then it would only have been about the bricks and mortar of the castle, whereas this took us into the life inside the castle. Although they also loved the castle. Yeah, they did, actually. Yeah. That was wonderful, especially the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> Working their way through the upper stories, Michelle's group of engineers and builders were surveying the condition of the stonework. Go and have a look and see how wide it is. How wide is it? Are all the walls in this castle that strong, do you think? No. No? Yeah. There's a bit of wall over there, that's not very strong. Oh, that bit there, that's broken. Well, I think that's one of the things we need to mend, isn't it? And this bit needs mending. That extract from Roll Up. The second in the series follows a key stage two class as they study the history of their own local environment. A few months later, in the primary school where Emma and Julie were on their first teaching practice, they got a chance to try out a local study. And, in partnership with the teachers who were supervising them, to put together a display of children's work in the classroom. Like the students' exhibition in college, this one had old photographs and maps, but it also included the children's own work and drawings and objects from the past that they'd collected from home. Julie worked with Sandra Holloway, whose class she shared on Key Stage 2 history projects. This is in 1884, right? so you're taking yourself back over 100 years, and you're standing outside... I asked Sandra 
What you need to remember if you tackle a local study with this age group. You need to research carefully. You need to do as much preparation for local studies as you would for a maths topic. But you don't go in it knowing all the answers or pretending to. Tell the children that you don't know the answer. Ask them how we could find out. It's a good idea to get a bit of background knowledge about the area before you start. So talk to people who've known the school and its community for some time. Yes, the scar down there, that's the original part of the building, and we've had two extensions since. Joining us now is Joan Annam Addo, a lecturer and researcher from Goldsmiths College in London. Joan, isn't a local study like that a bit narrow? It doesn't do much for children's understanding of the world, does it? Of course, it doesn't need to be narrow. Uh, local studies can be very exciting. And uh, my own research in London has made connections, starting with the local. Uh, the connections have been made with West Africa, with East India, and with the Caribbean. Uh, so we move from the local to the global. I guess the point is that local history can be as diverse as teachers would dare. And do they dare? Yes, teachers are, are taking on board now uh, increasingly that uh, the, the local history links with the people, sometimes national figures who feature locally, large homes, stately homes perhaps, where the people who have lived in them have changed. And uh, moving always and having a sense that there are connections that move locally, globally and back again, that's very important. Thanks, Joan. But how are teachers facing up to the challenges of teaching Key Stage 2 history? Well, to find out, we visited Emma Cox and her Year 4 class in a large city centre primary school. One of the main aims that I want to get out of it is that children are, feel confident enough to be able to question question what is going on, question um, how things have been found out. Um, and I try to instill a sense that um, you, they shouldn't always take it for granted what they found out. They should always be asking questions, how it was found out, who found it out, you know, could there be a different perspective put on it. It's just, you know, to be confident in looking at history in that way, not just accepting everything that they see or read, but really looking at it with some real specific skills in mind. Well, Lord Carnarvon came over. So who's got a different answer? We've had Howard Carter, we've had the servants. Who thinks a different per, uh, person or association should keep the artefact? Verity? I think that it should, the museum should have it because um, then everyone can see it. But whereas if, if anyone else had it, they might like to, they might want to keep it so no one can see. I hope that um, the children I teach will remember more about history than I remember because I think I was taught uh, more sort of dates and things. The only things I actually do remember was the occasional trip we used to go to the Castle Museum or something. But I hope the variety of uh, ways in which um, we teach in the classroom, using different group methods and different ways of recording things and more discussion will hopefully stick in, in their minds more and they'll be able to remember it a lot, a lot better. And Emma's here with us now. Emma, just watching that report makes me realise how much history teaching has changed since I was at school. But do you really think children are more knowledgeable about the past than they used to be? They do know more and they get excited about it. They are willing to learn so much about it, I think, because they can compare the lifestyle of someone, say, who lived in ancient Egypt to their lifestyle and see comparisons and see similarities and differences. And that really interests them because it comes from themselves. And history is presented to the children in so many ways. There's um, computers, through texts and books, um, through drama, through videos. It's all um, mediums that they're able to get hold of and, um, and work with really easily. So their knowledge is increasing all of the time. Um, the work we've just been doing on the ancient Egyptians, the children can tell you um, how they used to live, who they would work with, what sorts of jobs people would have, the things that they would eat. They are able to talk about it quite openly. But it's not just the um, facts that they're getting to grips with, it's the way that they're approaching history, which is helping them to increase their knowledge. They're getting more confident in looking for bias in evidence, 
um, whether evidence is um, the truth or whether perhaps the way it's been presented uh, puts a slant on it. It's just getting information from artifacts. You know, who's, where, where's it come from? Who did it belong to? And they're really concentrating very much on the things that they can see put in front of them, and it's really helping them to gain more knowledge. Thanks, Emma. Well, that's the present. Now, Mike, for the future, what's the future of history and heritage? Well, I think the past has got a great future because, as Emma says, the kids are interested in, in history, in doing history and discovering history. And I think when they go on to secondary school, they're going to be wanting more of it and they're going to be wanting exciting history and we hope that they take it further and perhaps in their lifelong learning programs that everyone is going to be um, taking part in some of those will be looking for history as part of what they want to do but it's not just the sort of academic side of it the reading side of it lots and lots of people are taking part in history now local societies discovering the past investigating the past but there are lots of people who do reenactments, and even more people that visit reenactments, mm -hmm. and then even more people that visit ancient sites and ancient places. And 11 million people visit English heritage sites, and that's only a small proportion of the, of the whole visiting heritage, heritage public. That's and Joan cool. said that we have, you know, we have diverse cultures um, within our society now, um, and I think people are going to want to investigate um, their own cultures within their own local environment mm -hmm. to start with, and then perhaps work beyond that. So I think, I think history's got an exciting future. Right, well, we're coming up to the end of the programme. My thanks to Joan Aramado, and Mike Corbisley and Emma Cox. And let's hope there'll be just as much support and enthusiasm for teaching history in the future as we've seen today. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.